um, good evening or good afternoon or good morning, depending on, on when you're, where you're joining us from, I guess when and where you're joining us from. Uh, I am Meredith Lehman, the uh, Head of Museum Education at the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum at Washington University in St. Louis. And it is my pleasure to welcome you this evening to the second annual Women and the Kemper Lecture with the brilliant scholar, Washington University visiting Hearst professor, and um, also want to add practicing artist, Anne Chang, who is um, joining us this evening. Before uh, I continue, I want to first acknowledge that I am joining you from St. Louis on the ancestral lands of the Osage Nation, Missouri, Illini Confederacy, and many other tribes who were unjustly removed. We recognize these communities as we live, work, study, and benefit from this occupied land. Uh, so for our talk tonight, um, in her talk titled Monsters, Cyborgs, and Vases, Sectors of the Yellow Woman, Anne presents the history of racialized gender and representations of Asiatic femininity, or what she calls ornamentalism. Her talk tonight will also look at how contemporary Asian artists call attention to and disrupt these narratives offering alternate possibilities. After Anne's lecture, we will engage in a brief Q&A before opening up um, the audience for questions. So please share your questions throughout the talk using the Q&A feature. And this is located on the bottom of your screen for most devices. Closed captions are also available and that can be found by clicking um, the live transcript button, which is um, on the bottom of your device. We are recording tonight's talk for those who aren't able to attend or if you'd like to revisit um, the program. And this will be available on the museum's YouTube channel in a few weeks. I want to take a moment to thank the Women and the Kemper Organization for their support of this program, which allows us to highlight the incredible work of women in the visual arts. And importantly, this is the last day of Women's History Month too. I also want to recognize the Department of English for their generous collaboration and to Dylan Brown and Chris Ang in particular, who are joining us for the talk this evening. Before I hand it over to Dylan to introduce our speakers, I would like to thank you, Anne, for sharing your timely work with us. It's been wonderful to be able to meet with you over the last year, and um, I was really excited to hear your talk also on Tuesday for the um, Hearst Lecture. I'm very grateful that we have the opportunity um, to engage in conversation with you. So thank you. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dylan. Thank you, Meredith. And thanks everybody who's here. I appreciate your attendance. Um, and it's very exciting to be a part of this event at the Kemper. And I also wanna just acknowledge that uh, Nicolette Horning, who's one of the English department's administrators has been absolutely instrumental in making things happen. So thank you to Nikki. I don't know if you're here or not, but um, a thousand thanks for helping facilitate. So I'm gonna begin by admitting that I feel just a little bit out of place. You can tell even by my kind of stolid, unesthetic background that I'm not really an art person. Um, I'm an associate professor in the English department and our speaker, Anne Anlin Ching, is also a member of an English department at Princeton University. Uh, the situation also feels even more incongruous to me, given that I specialize in Caribbean literature, while our speaker tonight is actually a renowned scholar of ethnic American literature and culture with a particular specialization in Asian American. So part of what I'm gonna say is just a bit of explanation of how we ended up here um, in the same space. But first I'm gonna just introduce briefly my colleague, Chris Ng, whose picture you can see on the screen right now, he will be on camera live uh, after the talk he is an assistant professor in English. He's a specialist in Asian American literature, and he has graciously agreed to lead the Q&A after Anne's talk, thereby compensating for my own lack of proficiency in Asian American topics with his own expertise. And I always wanna throw out thank you to Chris too, because he's very gracious to agree to this. So our speaker tonight, Professor Cheng, is visiting WashU as a Hearst professor for the English department as Meredith has already said, and this is a, a really nice endowment from Fanny Hurst, who um, some of the more mature members of the audience might know as the author of Imitation of Life. She's a, an alumna of WashU, and she donated a bunch of money to bring famous scholars in to, to meet people and sort of interact with students and faculty. And so I invited uh, Anne after asking my advanced graduate students if there were any exciting eminent scholars that they 
really wanted to meet. And one of them strongly advocated for Anne. I'd heard of her, um, but since she works pretty far outside my research field, I actually hadn't read her work carefully at all. So I read some and it was great. And as tackles issues of race and subjectivity and gender in incredibly eloquent and innovative ways. And indeed, I found myself getting quite enthusiastic about how what she was saying strongly resonated with my own work, despite our disciplinary divergences. Tempting as it is, I'm not gonna bore you with my own work and how it connects to Anne's now, because we're actually here to hear her talk. But I will say that in reading her work, over time, it became quite clear to me that she was becoming increasingly interested, less in literature than in culture, as an all-encompassing network of representations with a particular emphasis on visual aesthetics. And I mean, this is important as well, because when we think of race, especially, and, and ethnicity, it often registers in the visual um, realm. So this is in fact why I got in touch with Meredith to see if the Kemper might wanna host Anne during her visit and happily they said yes. And that is in fact how we are here today. Um, and thank you for agreeing to that. I think it's really nice to work together. Uh, so I have a few more things to say about Anne and then I'll let her talk. She has three published books to her name, The Melancholy of Race, Psychoanalysis, Assimilation and Hidden Grief, which appeared in 2001. Second Skin, Josephine Baker and the Modern Surface, which appeared in 2013. And Ornamentalism, uh, on which this talk I believe is based, uh, it appeared in 2019. And so doing the math and series, it seems like you've got 12 years, then six years. And then, so there should be a book coming out this year, right? Um, if you're keeping that series up. So we look forward to that um, later in the year. Um, and so these titles, I think, give some sense of the breadth of her concerns as well as her steady move towards visual culture. And this fascination reveals itself in content as well as form. And I was particularly struck by this in reading her most recent book, or Ornamentalism. And because in it, a few pages into the introduction, the writing voice stops and readers, readers of the book are presented instead with a series of 12 beautifully reproduced images. For a literature professor, or even really an attentive reader, I imagine, the effect is quite profound. We are being asked to look as we turn the pages, to absorb what we see, and to contemplate it before returning to the verbal register. And it is this impulse that I find so compelling and eloquent in Anne's work, and I hope you'll get a taste of it tonight. It's an insistence that we look again at things, notice the only apparently superficial details, reconsider and revise what we think, all in the interest of a more productive, more sensitive, and above all, a more just sense of how the world is working and what we might, might be able to do to change it. So please join me in welcoming Professor Anne Ann Lin Cheng, who will be presenting a talk entitled, I'm gonna read it off the screen, Monsters, Cyborgs, and Other Vessels, Apparitions of the Yellow Woman. Thank you, Dylan. The, the title changed a little bit. So, that's it. Um, but thank you so much for the really kind introduction. I also want to thank Meredith and the wonderful staff at the Kemper Art Museum and everyone in the English department who have welcomed me and for hosting me um, this week. Um, uh, Wash you. I'm very delighted to be here. And my talk tonight is about 40 minutes. I like to warn people. <laughs> um, uh, but I think there'll be some interesting images to look at at the very least. So thank you so much for your time. And now I'll just get started. In common parlance, we speak of black women, white women, brown women, but not yellow women. Why not? Is it too dated? Is it too ugly? Is it because she is no longer a relevant category? The recent and continuous surge in anti-Asian American violence, often directed specifically against Asian and Asian American women, tells us that in fact, we need to think really hard about the fraught association between Asiatic femininity, aesthetics, and violence. Even as the label, the yellow woman, fades from contemporary usage, the Asiatic figure that it denotes still stimulates passion and derision in multiple sectors of everyday life. How is it that a figure that is so encrusted with racist and sexist meaning so ubiquitously invoked to this day and so readily recognized as a problem or as a victim 
should at the same time be such a theoretical black hole, a residue of critical fatigue. How many of you here are already starting to feel a certain kind of tiresomeness being talked about when I mention the objectification of Asian women? It's such a cliche. But the problem is often by identifying a stereotype or a cliche, we stop thinking about it because we think we have come to know everything about it. The relationship between Asian and Asiatic femininity and objecthood has, been, has a very, very long history in Western racial imagination and speaks a very specific visual vocabulary. So we're gonna, I'm gonna show you a series of slides that some of it, which are in the book, but um, just so that you can get a sense of how, how vast this visual um, archive is. From museums to movie theaters, fashion houses to science fiction, the boardroom to the bedroom, this highly fabricated figure and particular kind of designed femininity haunts and fuels the American imagination about persons and non-persons. We can label and dismiss this vast archive under the category of Orientalism, uh, a term developed by El Sayi, to refer to a set of colonial stereotypical images and fantasies about the East. And that's a totally accurate to describe this history. But the story and our own critical intellectual work cannot simply stop there, because to do so is to ignore what this history has also created, which is a particular, the formation of a particular kind of racialized gender that hardly needs a real body to acquire its fullest and most sensorial presence. All it takes is the swerve of a fan, the swish of silk or a pattern of ceramic, for Asiatic femininity to achieve its fullest presence. Asiatic femininity in the Western racial imagination, in other words, offers an entwined dance between embodiment and abstraction, a particular kind, an idiosyncratic kind of corporeal fantasy that in fact does not require the biological body at all, a racial and gender formation that is rooted not in the flesh, but in design. This visual archive that I have collected for you here is but a small demonstration of a vast, vast and enduring association in Western philosophic discourse, in literature and philosophy, as well as in art history, between the Asiatic, the association between the Asiatic with femininity and specifically with decorative thingliness, a conflation of the Oriental with the feminine and with extravagant, superfluous, artificial, decadent ornamentality. In my recent book, I call this confluence of the oriental with the ornamental and this chain of meta and this sort of chain of metonymic that mean metonymic meaning that has been created ornamentalism. What is a person and what is a thing? Who counts as one or the other? The meeting of beauty and terror, person and objecthood has long been a troubling dilemma for the history of art from Titian's rape of Lucretia to Picasso's Guernica. But the convergence of beauty and terror at the site of Asiatic womanhood has produced one of the most persistently seductive fantasy of the 19th and 20th century and has exacted almost, and has exacted, exacted the most human price. Today, I wanna to focus on the figure of the yellow woman and her intimate relationship to aesthetic objecthood not in order to retell the story of objectification, which I don't think you need me to tell you that, but to do the much harder work of looking at how we understand life and ontology at the site of that object making. What does it mean to survive as a thing? What does it mean to be the beautiful, ugly thing? If unforgiving objecthood is a condition of Asiatic femininity, then who or what is left of her in the 21st century? How do we think about what counts as life and agency for those for whom both have been severely compromised? It is the larger gambit of my book 
that to simply reprimand and dismiss this vast history of synthetic femininity is to miss out on what it also has to teach us precisely about a genealogy of personhood, one that has been objectified, yes, but that also nonetheless speaks back against the organic, speak back against and is intimately um, bound up with the, the ideal of an organic integrated person that is born out of the Western enlightenment. So the processes of this object making can be objectifying, of course, but they can also yield, I think, surprising and unexpected, often undetected forms of alternative lives or forms of survival after objectification. Despite the term ornamentalism, I, which I admit is a really awkward word, <laughs> I, name to, I mean to name this Western philosophical and aesthetic conflation of the oriental with the ornamental, but more than trying to name a symptom, I also use the term to underscore the processes through which Western personhood gets named, conceived through not the Lockean um, organic body that we have all learned from the Enlightenment, but through a synthetic ornamental gestural practice. These processes of person making through the prosthetic and the ornamental and the artificial can take place materially, legally, and culturally, and of course, imaginatively. And my book does the work of showing how these alchemical moments and processes happen when persons get turned into things and when things get turned into persons, and how we could find these moments in various arenas from the American legal system to the American museum to American literature. Right? So ornamentalism is thus for me, not only about the crisis of having been made into a thing, but about the condition, but it is also about the condition of life and possible animacy within objectness. It is about how personhood might be indebted to objecthood. And to focus on the making of a highly artificial, ornamented and synthetic person is to rethink some of our most basic assumption about what constitutes a person and what can count as a life. If Edward Said offered us Orientalism as a critique, as a political critique, I like to think of ornamentalism as offering us a theory of being. And so for the rest of the talk, I want to offer you a close reading of a series of 20th and 21st century haunting humanoid object or object humans that I think are um, haunting precisely because they embed um, um, a history of violence that has been um, unarticulated. So let's start with this image, these two images here, our 21st century geisha right here. Many of you will recognize these images as still shots from Rupert Center's 2017 film, Ghost in the Shell, starring Scarlett Johansson. Sanders' film is a live action remake of a Japanese anime of the same, of a very popular Japanese anime under the same name. And for science fiction fans, this association of the Asiatic with technology and speculative, speculative fiction is hardly new. From Blade Runners to The Matrix to Ex Mahina to, Cl Atlas, to Cloud Atlas to Big Hero 6 to Ghost in the Shell here, we see a pervasive association of Asia and Asians in hyper and hypo technological terms, what some scholars have come to call techno-orientalism. And indeed, just last week, The New Yorker had an essay um, that pronounced, quote, the future is Asian and Asians and Asians are robots, end quote. So this was The New Yorker just last week. But for the most part, techno-orientalism refers simply to basically Saidian orientalism, but only in the, but just you know, applied to the realm of technology. What I want to suggest today is that there is a much deeper and more entangled relationship between the Asiatic as a kind of racial formation and Western anxieties about technological threat to the human. Let me begin by pointing out two paradoxes that have always sort of like bothered me about techno-orientalism as a phenomenon. One, why should Western futurity imagine itself as Asian? especially during times of rampant anti-Asian sentiment? And two, how is it that the yellow woman can represent both regressive atavism and technological futurity? That is, what is it about her in the Western imagination that make her at once the slave girl and the cyborg 
as you see here, simultaneously a degraded, a sign of degraded corporeality and upgraded technology. The answer has everything to do with what I'm calling the ornamentalist logic of synthetic Asiatic femininity. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Set in Japan in the year 2029, Ghost in the Shell tells the story of a cyborg policewoman named Major Kusanagi and her partner, whose mission was to hunt down a mysterious and powerful hacker of human minds called the Puppet Master. That's just basically the plot. Sanders' casting of Scarlett Johansson as Kusanagi had, many, had led many to criticize him for Orientalist appropriation and for whitewashing, that's the term used, um, the main character. But I actually find this choice of the white face over the yellow female body actually quite revealing particularly about the intimate employment between the synthetic and the organic at the site of Asiatic femininity. As we have already started to see in the archeology span that I um, run through for you uh, at the beginning of this talk, the yellow, the yellow woman was, even before 20th century cybernetics came into being, already provoking a crisis about synthetic life. The technologically enhanced Asian woman in science fiction signal something much more than a orientalist backdrop or just exotic decoration. She actually oftentimes in a lot of these meditation, science fiction meditation embodies the very stubborn teleology that has long tied Asiatic femininity to artificiality and Western meditations on roles of persons and non-persons in speculations about the future. The preoccupation with the animation of the inanimate isn't just a result of 20th century technological advancement. It is a fantasy and an anxiety that reaches as far back as the 18th century and the age of exploration when the West first came into contact with racial others in the very real reality of human being being turned into uncanny assemblages of human parts and things, right? Um, object for trade. That is to say, the long durée of imperial transformation. I want to underscore the ways in which the Asiatic, and in particular Asiatic femininity, operates in these fantasies as the very site, the very body on which pre-science, on which pre-science fiction's most profound meditation about what constitutes a human um, comes into um, its most urgent um, animation. It is not a coincidence that the very plot and the central philosophic obsession of a film like Ghost in the Shell and many others like it, like Blade Runner, for example, turns precisely on this anxiety about the dangerous affinity between the human and the inhuman. Much of the film is about whether we or the character of Kusanagi herself consider Kusanagi to be deserving of human consideration when she is, quote, but a machine. But more importantly, and most uh, per, and but more importantly, the only and most persuasive thing that lends the human element and hence pathos to this impervious and killing machine that is a major. That is, say, what makes us feel for her, and she's a very um, passive character, right? She doesn't she doesn't show feeling. She doesn't have, she doesn't really have you know um, a, a kind of an inner life, right? Um, mostly, but what makes us feel for her is the last discovery near the end of the movie when we find out that there is a minor trace of a human consciousness that is still inside of her body and which, by the way, and not accidentally, turns out to be the cranial residue of a young Japanese girl whose body was destroyed and hijacked for experiment. So we found out at the big reveal at the end of the movie that what's underneath Scarlett Johansson's character is actually um, the brain of a little Japanese girl. To see in Sanders' film this big reveal that the major played by Johansson was in fact once a Japanese girl as merely Orientalist appropriation is to miss the ornamentalist logic that provides the foundation for this film's meditations about human and inhumanness. Donna Haraway, the cultural critic and feminist, thinks what she calls cyborg politics can be revolutionary because it has the potential to move us away from totalizing categories and make us confront the reality of the human machine hybrid. But a movie like Ghost in the Show cannot quite actually offer us that revolutionary cyber politics, I would argue, because it is ironically 
um, very reliant on a profound nostalgia about the sanctity of the human. That is to say, the film gestured to what we mean to really consider human and artificiality as, um, as a, a real hybrid, but it pulls back from that possibility because it's finally very sentimental about a human. And what makes Kusanagi lackable and deserving of human treatment in the end is precisely this residue of human corporeality in her brain, a trace of humanity that is significantly also the fractured, impaired, broken residue of Asiatic femininity. Throughout most of the film, the protagonist played by Johansson in the, in the standard film version, she was simply called the major. So you don't actually even get the sort of emphasis on her Japanese name, we just know she was the name major. Sender suppresses for most of the film, the original anime's full name and therefore explicit Japanese name. This may help the whitewashing to take place, but it also has the opposite effect of punching up the big reveal at the end. The disclosure that her white body has been playing host to a Japanese brain all along. By fulfilling a racial logic that has been implicit all along, that is the yellow woman um, is the ghost inside the machine of white, merged, white modern personhood. The revelation of the real Asian woman inside the synthetic white machine dramatizes the racial logic enabled by ornamentalism, that is to say synthetic and prosthetic Asiatic femininity as the very stuff of Western futurity. The yellow woman reminds us that the human has always been embroiled with the inhuman well before the threat of the modern machine. We don't need the 21st century cyborg for us to confront the discomfort of undeniable human alterity. That, has, that is a crisis that is already provoked and embodied by the racial other. And most significantly, a racial otherness that is implicated with the mechanical and the artisanal. The history of Orientalism in the West is not just a history of, of objectification and commodification, but it is also a history of personification, the making of personness out of things. This non-person normally seen outside of uh, modernity and that's supposed to a kind of Western organic human individualism actually embodies a forgotten genealogy about the coming together of life and non-life labor and style that condition the modern conceit of humanness. So we have arrived at a, something of a double-edged sword, racial and gender difference, in this case, Asiatic femininity, entail a history of profound dehumanization. But at the same time, they have also provided the most powerful and affective agents for humanizing the dreams of machines. The artificiality of Asiatic femininity is this the ancient dream that feeds the machine in the heart of modernity. And I want to suggest that well before cybernetics and technology as we know it today, there has been a war over new materials, the materia nova, over technology and design in the relationship between the East and West as early as the 18th and 19th century. I am talking about that other technological invention that was such a source of desire and contention between the East and the West, between Britain and America and China, um, a contention so fraught that it made Britain and America introduce opium into China in order to offset the balance of power in their, fa in their favor. I'm of course talking about Chinese ceramic which you can think of as one of the first true global commodities in the modern world and which spurred tremendous innovations in technology and design in the West. Recent scholarship have shown in the area of material culture has revealed the complex history of Chinese porcelain, its importance in early global imperial trade, its role in spurring European technological invention and their decorative design, its impact on the growing economy of the new America, its social and cultural values in Denmark, Germany, France, as well as England and its American colonies. Um, and I don't have time to talk about it, but we could talk later about George Washington and his incredible collection of porcelain. To this richly documented history, I would add, we should also think about the highly wrought and fraught affinity between this white gold, which is what they used to call porcelain, and the making of yellow flesh. 
More than embodying economic and social value, Chinese porcelain, I want to point out, came to personify a set of affective and somatic values that are then attributed back to so-called Chinese people. Right? Out of the era of the China trade, Atlantic slavery, and their aftermath, we see the birth of a material culture that shapes the physical and emotional values and moral values attached to racialized bodies. Objects and materials are racialized, yes, but objects and materials also racialize people. Scholars, my, scholars my, like uh, Matilda Fen and Qi Ming Yang have demonstrated how material substances spurred or excited chemical experiments with colors that not only fed artisanal and industrial revolutions across centuries, but also promoted racial ideas. Mahogany's red sheen, glossy black lacquer, translucent white porcelain, the brilliant colors of indigo, coconut dyes and silver ores all carried and produced racial meanings in their times. Race making in the 19th century was thus not just a scientific or even economic project, it was also an artisanal one as indebted to ornamental practice and material making as he was to the pseudobiology of ethno of early ethnography. Imported goods and materials of Asia and the Americas held novel structural properties like durability or elasticity that Europeans not only strove to imitate and harness for their own manufacturing, but also for them increasingly came to be associated with and projected onto the racialized bodies from where, from where these objects came. Porcelain, what was formerly what was known as Chu Kualin Chinese porcelain was particularly interesting, is particularly interesting in this regard <clears throat> because of its alchemical and seemingly impossible properties, known not only for its glossy beauty, its precarious refinement, its receptivity to color and design manipulation, but also for its surprising durability, its miraculous capacity to sustain the extreme high heat that lends it its translucency. This invention of porcelain as a precious and rare new material, an advanced production process that baffled Western manufacturers for decades and served as something of a precursor to 20th century fascination with new materials like plastic, for example, promised in the 18th century the magic of material transformation. Ceramics was the plastic of the, you know, ceramic in the, in, in the 19th century and 18th century is the plastic of the 20th, 20th century. Porcelain thus denotes both hardness and plasticity, old world beauty and new world technology, fragile daintiness and insensate crudeness, a mixture of antithetical meanings that are then prescribed or ascribed onto the very stuff of Asian bodies. Um, and um, I don't have time to talk about it too much here, but the, the coolie, uh, the discourse on the coolie in the 19th century was all, all about how they can withstand heat, that they're the ideal laborers um, because they're like machines, they're, you know, they were like porcelain, they were hard that way. Um, and certainly um, the association, um, which is almost tried today between Asian female skin with porcelain, a cliche um, of the pearlized skin of Asian women that exists to this day, as we can sort of attest to by our fascination with K-beauty, for example, in fact, carries also this profound and layered history of ornamentalist confusion affecting the merging of yellow flesh and white porcelain. It is not surprising then that the fates of Chinese female bodies and Chinese porcelain run parallel to each other from the 19th to the 20th century. That is to say, when it came to representing the precariousness of a system of Western wealth based on importing novel Eastern goods, with, you know, in the 19th century. When that um, system st started to sort of lose its radiance because European um, American acquisitive, acquisitiveness began to run in excess of what you could offer China in return, this early romance with China, both as a little C and China with a big C, began to deteriorate. This breakdown left lasting traces in American law, foreign policy, and economic policy. From US foreign policy and trade agreements in the 18th century 
to discriminating immigration laws in 19th and 20th century in America, who can see the traces of this continual breakdown, right? China's meaning in the American popular imagination changed just as Chinese porcelain itself come to connote tacky crockery. And crucially for our discussion, the breakdown of this country's China romance marked the bodies um, of Asian American and Asian women as well. The New York Times had this to say about the Chinese women's gymnastic team at the 1996 Summer Olympics, quote, the Chinese remain the world's most erratic top gymnasts. And today, like many of Ming boss, their routines look lovely, but have cracks in several places, end quote. It is in the context of this vast ornamentalist history surrounding porcelain and ceramics that we can begin to approach a contemporary work like this. Here, the Chinese female body seemed to have been petrified into domestic and collectible things, broken pieces of teapot, cups, plates. Is this a person or a thing? A, struct, a, a sculpture or a dress? Beauty or ugliness? Wing victory or the mad woman in the attic? Made by contemporary artist Li Xiaofang, this piece is clearly not human, but nor is it entirely a thing. The weight of material, of history, of domesticity, of femininity in this piece implies petrification, but the form suggests flight. It has those little wing-like sleeves, right? Entitled Beijing Memory Number no. 5, this 2009 sculpture and dress, it was actually made to be wearable, was part of a series known for using ceramics excavated from archeological sites throughout China. The museum catalog, this is from the Met, the museum catalog attribute the ceramic fragment to the Qing dynasty, which is between 1644 to um, the early 1900s, commonly known as the last great Chinese dynastic empire, suggesting that the memory being recomposed here may be a memory of a lost imperial China, like a nostalgia for that. Yet Beijing memory number no. five exercises a particularly intricate articulation of Chinese history and datedness and authenticity, because when we look at it more closely, the idea, the very idea of history in this piece turns out to have suffered a great deal of manipulation. In the constructed rubble of this body that is a ceramic woman, we can discern a scattering of some still intact Chinese idiograms. Many of them are out of context and several are placed upside down. I, you know, maybe as an as a ironic statement about value or a jab uh, at an old joke about Chinese illeg illegibility for Western viewers. Um, but anyway, some of, you can find these words, but some of them are sideways and upside down. And the words are, um, some of them are precious, tea, superior. Others offer seemingly very precise self-authentication or stamp rain dates, such as Zhuang reign of the great Ming dynasty, which is yeah, um, 1400. Which, and in other words, you, you can see in some of these, um, the bottom of these pieces, a kind of a, a provenance to the pieces. Um, and they purport to indicate a royal workshop. So, this, so the shards themselves date themselves earlier in time than what the museum has dated the piece prior to, you know, to, so to the being prior to the Qing dynasty indicated by the catalog. But we cannot actually be um, complacent with, the, with what we think we know about the history of these pieces, because these, even as these fragments promise a more precious commodified pastness the, the certification of provenance, both inside and outside the artwork, only serve to underscore the homelessness of these remains. Moreover, given that the practice of inscribing dates onto objects to authenticate origin had degraded fairly early on into a practice of affectation or even for forgery, this kind of designation is likely to be more misleading than not. That is to say, this piece is, um, the, the, the ceramic 
have been advertised um, and um, uh, offered as authentic um, archaeological finds, right, from China. But at the same time, we actually don't know how authentic that is. And since an earlier date on these plates will signal a grander pretentiousness and, of course, greater value, and since the Zhuang Dynasty, which is when the era when this, um, these, some of these marks say they are, was exactly when such inscription became um, common and oftentimes subject to forgery, these fragments are probably anything but what they say they are. Decorative ornament and utilitarian domesticity merge in this piece, reassemble but stranded, an art object, but a collection and also a collection of disposable things, a thing of memory and trouble origin, an object transiting between the junkyard, the workshop, the commercial gallery, and the museum. This ceramic woman underscores the unstable difference between curio and treasure, between both mediated precisely through notions of Chinese femininity. This uneasy fluctuation between value and waste has always haunted the specter of the curio, which is to say has always haunted the quote on an oriental thing. The ceramic woman, this ceramic woman is too, I suggest, a technology, a mechanical assemblage forged out of abandoned erratic residue. This is flesh congealed into porcelain, as well as porcelain invoking the possibility of flesh, making Beijing memory number five something of a teleological sister to Major Kusanagi and other recent Asian cyborgs. I don't think it is a coincidence that contemporary female Asian American artists in the diaspora, Asian and Asian American artists in the diaspora have been returning again and again to this phenomenon of synthetic thing made flesh. This is an installation view of Korean, South Korean artist Lee Bull's Cyborg and Monster series at the Art Songjae Center in Seoul in 1998. Crafted from materials often used for women's ornaments, including silicone, metals, resin, chain, crystal beads, and other organic matter sometimes, Lee Bull's twin series, Cyborg and Monster, Cyborg is a white um, series, and the other ones are the monsters, shown here together, dramatizes the complicity between the organic and the inorganic between art and waste. We might think of these works as continued meditation on what I'm calling the apparition of the yellow woman, for they represent the two ideological endpoints of Asiatic femininity in the world of ornamentalist transformation, the monster and the cyborg. The monster being the perversion of organic excess, while the cyborg being the distillation of synthetic design. The cyborg series, made from porcelain, which we know by now carries this very sort of um, fraught history with it. It's made from either porcelain or from silicone, the stuff often used in human cosmetic surgery. This series gives us these idealized female figures. At first glance, the cyborg series with its minimalist clean white lines would seem to contrast the, against the um, sort of colors and vibrant angst of the amorphous uh, monster series, you can see it in the background. But on closer examination, I think the cyborgs and the monster share more affinity or genealogy than one might initially have suspected. To begin with, with the cyborgs, you can't help but notice that these idealized figures, these very beautifully formed figures are actually a mixture of precision and fragmentation, of power and fragility, these android bodies are always presented as amputated, more or less crippled, not in working order, or to put it differently, in, is, in, an insistent, in a state of insistent refusal to be useful. Embedded within their geometric beauty is a kind of wreckage. And then let's look at the monsters. The monsters appear grotesque, asymmetrical, blobby, flew, full of flesh-like limbs, tendrils and exposed organs that are explosively congealed, morphing yet rarefied. Indeed, they appear closer and closer to the cyborg the longer you think about them. For if the cyborg's pristine symmetry was always, always entails a loss and incompletion, then the monsters too straddles that fine line or that ambivalence between life and non-life. They are congealed and yet suggestive of growth 
They seem full and animate, bursting out, and yet it is also a fermentation that is also arrested. In short, Li dramatizes how the monsters and the cyborgs may be sisters. It therefore would not surprise us to find this other piece, also by Li Bu, called Amaryllis. It is as if the cyborg and the monster had a child. This is the hybrid or assemblage born out of monsters and cyborg feminist politics. This is Li's imagined telos of Asiatic femininity, this machine plant human life. So I will end with this one last piece, which is by South Korean artist Lee Sung Kyung and titled Translated Vase TVW1. The sculpture clearly mimes a female figure. You can kind of sort of detect or think you think of legs, a head, etc. Even as the material and the title, translated based, insist that this is but a thing. In the artist's own words, quote, the translated based series consists of sculptures reconstructed from discarded ceramic fragments. Skillful ceramic masters reproduce traditional Korean ceramics, and the vases with minor defects are destroyed to keep the rarity and value of the surviving masterpieces. I piece these destroyed pots back together in the manner of three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle covering the cracks in gold. From the moment of destruction, I obtain a chance to intervene and fabricate new narratives with my own translation." And so, with translated vase or vase, each broken piece operates as a self-forming agent that appears to be generating an infinite proliferation towards an unexpected fabrication, an assemblage of fictitiously loquacious and stuttering discards, suggesting not only that art and waste, that human and the inhuman can coexist, but also they may be profoundly, materially, historically, and imaginatively indebted to one another. There is in Mandarin a phrase, hua ping, that is used to describe pretty women. Right? Hua ping means literally vase, a flower vase, but it is used often pejoratively to refer to women who serve as decorative backgrounds. Let's say like, you know, like a trophy wife, for example. Here, the idea of the pinghua, the decorative vase, has become a once more artful and more resistant, more broken, and yet more reassembled. If Beijing memory number five was all about the crisis of history and memory, and if Li Bu, cyborg, and monsters extend that meditation to their most monstrous and technological ends, then we might think of Li Sang Yang deliberately anthropomorphic non-person person here as an instantiation of their meeting. It is as if Li's ceramic woman, the Beijing memory number five on the left, has suffered an internal explosion, becoming a once more voluptuous and more thing-like, somehow simultaneously more woman and more thing in the in Isakyan's piece. Right? Isakyan invokes a history of ceramic as invention and as global commodity. She also references what I'm calling ornamentalism, underscoring Asiatic femininity's paradoxical um, relationship to both excess organicity and inorganicity, tracking the afterlife and perhaps the weird beauty of survival of what it means for Asiatic femininity to survive as ornament. Here, the repetition and the series could be part of a minimalist vocabulary that has taken on an explosion or an implosion, so as to produce a decomposition in the very act of this formal growth and assemblage. If the urn or the vase usually connotes an invitation to interiority on the one hand, or the hollowness of death on the other, think of Keats' Ode to the Grecian Urn, then it is noticeable that Isa Yang's vases and pots and urns here are all sealed, offering no entry. Donna Haraway, whom I mentioned earlier, has very famously stated that she would rather be a cyborg than a goddess by which she means that she prefers the option of being a postmodern technological figure over the reclamation of some naturalized, idealized femininity. But the genealogy of monsters, cyborgs, and other human things 
that we have been following today suggest that, to say at the very least, that we really need something beyond the dyad of cyborg versus goddess. So let me end on a series of propositions. If the Asian woman in the Western cultural imagination is the cyborg par excellence, that always curious assemblage of fleshly fantasy and projected inanimate machinery, if the cyborg is always already a monster at heart, and finally, if monstrosity offers the very possibility of art an alternative life form, then we must reconsider all the terms preconditioning our previous understanding of who or what constitutes the human, the cyborg, and the monster. We would, in short, have to forge a new vocabulary for thinking and talking about what is beauty in a broken world. Thank you. I will stop there. Good evening, everyone. Um, Dr. Cheng, thank you so much for your incredibly rich talk. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Eng. Uh, just a reminder, if you do have any questions that you would like to pose to our esteemed speaker, please do fill in the Q&A um, section box. Uh, in the meantime, um, I will start us off with a couple of questions. Um, as a way of um, kickstarting our conversation. Um, so Dr. Chen, in the end, um, you mentioned the ceramic dress a few times throughout your talk. I know um, in your larger book, um, everyone go get a copy if you haven't already. Um, you talk about um, the kind of perversity or the insidious nature of the larger exhibit that showcased many of these objects. Um, and that's the 2015 Met exhibit, China Through the Looking Glass. And specifically, um, you pointed out the fact that in many ways, the exhibit went out of its way to um, acknowledge beforehand that you know, what's being showcased as part of the schema of Orientalism and its different racial fantasies. Um, as you say on page 89, um, you say the exhibition itself has already co-opted the term as an internal critique and alibi. Um, so uh, I want to invite you to think about, um, given that we are here today with the Kemper Art Museum, what might it look like to constitute a kind of more ethical practice, both in terms of museums curating these objects, but also um, for us as visitors engaging with these art objects and viewing them? Thank you so much. That's such a great question. And actually, I will answer it, but afterwards, I, I would love to ask Meredith, <laughs> who, who actually is a curator, how she thinks about this, um, because you know, I'm clearly not trained as a curator um, at all. But um, several things. First is that the, um, you know, I, I think as a visitor, one of the things that is really important is to go into any museum and realize that, um, that there is a curatorial logic, right? Um, and that that logic has its own assumptions, biases, whatever. Um, and you know that um, the, the philosopher um, um, Slavoj Slavo Žižek um, has this whole debate about, you know, do we actually see art based on what artists is showing us anymore? Or are we just seeing art through the curators? You know? um, but um, so I think a certain kind of awareness of I mean, understanding that these are not um, um, accidental or um, non-ideological construction. Um, and also, you know, it's really important to remember that the museum, and you know, and I, I say this with, you know, um, as someone who loves and who someone who loves and works in museum and super indebted to them as an institution, we also have to recognize that museums are probably like the most imperial space, <laughs> you know, ever. Um, you know, museum logic is about um, um, uh, a certain kind of imperial collection, right? Um, and this is why in the recent years, there's been all kinds of debate about trying to expatriate, you know, various objects back to their you know, nations of origin. But, you know, so, you know, it's one, it's important to remember that museum is itself uh, a colonial, has a colonial origin, has an imperial origin, and it was a stage for imperial um, uh, display and spectacle for many, many um, centuries. Um, and so I think, you know, it's important for, for visitors to remember that, but it's also important for, you know, curators. Um, um, so I think that one of the things that drove me nuts about the China Through the Looking Glass um, exhibit was that it was so, um, it wanted to have its cake and eat it too. You know, it was basically, it was, it was not honest 
Um, so it's, you know, it was they were clearly worried about being accused of Orientalist appropriation, which they were in fact afterwards anyway. People protested and all this stuff. Um, but they're, they're instead of so they said, you know, there's this thing called Orientalism, you know, where the West appropriate things from the East. But don't worry, this is not really a, a show about the real East. This is a show about how the East has inspired Western fantasies. Um, and so, in other words, their answer to "Don't worry about Orientalism. This is Orientalism." <laughs> That's basically what they said, which you know was a little bit madly. Um, it was it was a little insulting to to you know to the audience like intelligence. But um, but I think I one of the things. I would imagine, and I, th I think about this in terms of um, a dilemma in documentary too. And so I think that when you ask that question, I think that Trin Ming has work on, um, doc on the documentary and how she said that it's so important for the for the anthropologist and for the docu for the ethnographer um, not to document per se, but to sort of um, um, stand alongside, right? Rather than seeing yourself as the master who interpret this culture for you know, this foreign culture for your native um, uh, um, community, um, to think of yourself as a um, really, you know, as, as a visitor, as a, and as not a continual outsider who is standing alongside or sitting with. So I think um, somehow translating that into um, curatorial practice. And I think actually, you know, it's great for museums to um, acknowledge, acknowledge the, the power dynamic, the colonial history behind the 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 very presence and the collectivity of these objects, you know, in the museum. Um, so yeah, I love to hear Meredith thinks about. I mean, this this must be something you think about a great deal. Uh, well, I should start by saying I'm I'm not a curator, so I'm <laughs> I'm more in the um, learning and engagement side of the museum mm -hmm. as a museum educator. So I'm often, but I'm thinking about that sort of intersection between. Mm -hmm. Um, the object and the history of the institution, but also the sort of an audience um, audience engagement or visitor centered experience. And I do think, you know, across departments in the museum, we are absolutely having these conversations. And what you were saying, Anne, about this, um, this sort of stand along with makes me think about um, sort of um, collaborative curatorial practices that sort of think about curating not for and about but by and with and why that's a very important distinction for acknowledging the power that a cultural institution like a museum holds but also it's the ways that these colonial histories are so embedded within its practices um and to sort of recognize both recognize these histories but also push back against um itself as a sort of authoritative authority or um um, sort of a neutral or objective position when presenting presenting a, a, a collection or or an exhibition. Um, so what would it look like to have a really collaborative curatorial practice um, that includes the the voices, the perspectives of, of the community members, um, you know, whose identities or experiences are being being represented, um, and also valuing that as a, as a knowledge set too. Um, I think I, I think I, what you yeah. say is so important. I think true collaboration. You know, I mean, one of the things that the Met did of the channel to the Looking Glass was that they, they, you know, they asked um, Kai Wa Wang, who is who is one of the most probably the most famous Chinese um, filmmaker today, um, to uh, to write a piece in the catalog, um, and and he designed one of the rooms. And um, but that was, but it wasn't. It, it didn't feel like a collaboration. It felt uh -huh. like. And uh, an authentic alibi. <laughs> I think I didn't have a real Chinese person uh, to say this is okay. Um, so, um, so yeah, I think you know, being able to um, really um, produce that kind of collaboration and have that collaboration be um, visible, you know, to 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 the museum visit to spectators, whether it's in you know, not just in a catalog, but actually, I'm a true believer in in um, in signage, <laughs> like you know, like we should. We should, you know, offer a kind of narrative or context around which people might begin to approach, not to define for them how to think about these pieces, but how to, what are some of the terms, to, you know, with which one can come to it. Absolutely, yeah. Chris, did you um, want to, I want to, and if there was another question or if you want to ask, add anything from the, the Q&A that's coming in. 
Um, yeah, why don't we take a question from the Q&A? Um, okay. So we have a question from Donna Vetnik who says, thank you for this amazing lecture, exclamation point. How do you think the color or hue yellow plays into ornamentalism? And how do you think the color and its material or, or the artisanal properties, I'm guessing, has evolved into the 21st century? Um, okay, how did the color as part of the 21st century? Um, I think, you know, um, I think the, the, the word, the, the word yellow is, is really, um, interesting. Um, I, I want to begin by saying that I say the term, the words yellow woman, almost as a kind of therapeutic pra practice. Um, I don't want the term, I, I'm not using it to, to revaluate and to redeem it, you know, the way I say, you know, queerness has been redeemed as a political um, vocabulary. I don't want to redeem it. I, what I want to do is actually name the racialization because I think one of the major problems around Asian and Asian American femininity and women, womanhood, is that their racialization is often not acknowledged by larger American general public. Um, are they, are they, you know, so this, you know, do they count as, you know, do Asian and Asian Americans count as, you know, race subject who has suffered or, you know, there's all these sort of discourse around um, that, that sort of like avoids um, naming the racialization to which Asians and Asian Americans are always subjected to. And so I, I use that term to do that. Um, I don't work with the color yellow in a literal way. I think it's a really interesting um, uh, word because when just when the word yellow took on its negative term, I think yellow journalism, that that term came literally at the same time all the anti-Asian sentiments were going on in, in the US. Um, so I think the degradation of the color yellow um, has, everything to do with what was going on in US domestic and foreign policy in relation to Asia. Um, so I think the word yellow, um, which has a, you know, which can, you know, you could, you could go two ways. You could go towards gold or you could go towards, you know, the, the, the urinal, right? The, you can go towards the, the, the uh, you know, the, de the degraded form. Um, but I think the racialization and, and the degradation of yellow as a kind of term, not just as a color, um, has a lot to do with anti-Asian sentiment in the 19th century. Um, and um, uh, how do I think color and material has evolved in the 21st century? Um, that's a good question. I don't have an answer right now. I have to think about it. I would love to think about some examples of, if you have some example in mind of particular um, uh, instances of that, I'll be happy to talk about. I'm sorry, I, I'm blanking out on actual 21st examples around yellow. <laughs> I have to think about it. And we also have a question from Cora Chow. Um, okay. And they write, I noticed that two art pieces you mentioned exaggerate the breasts and buttocks of the female body, but do not show any female reproductive organ. It seems to tie in well with our conventional imagination of robots, hypersexual but infertile. How does the ornamental logic help us understand Asian female sexuality? Um, yeah, and that's actually a really great observation. I think it's uh, I think it's um, uh, the 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 same sort of um, uh, the anxiety. Because it's interesting you said that about the uh, infertility and robots, um, because it's interesting to think about how um, Asian American fertility. <clears throat> was actually one of the major reasons for the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, and that's, you know, so when, when, um, when um, num not even that many, it, it was actually a very small number, but the, the relatively supposedly large number of influx of Chinese migrant workers in the 19th century, um, many of them solicited um, as labor for the Transcontinental Railway or the gold rush. Um, part of the great anxiety was that these ch so-called Chinamen would come and have family and settle in the U.S., right? Um, so they're supposed to be disposable and um, temporary labor. And so 
the, the Chinese Exclusion Act, which is in uh, the final version is 1882, but there was a lot leading up to it, um, was um, you know, all but prohibited the entrance of um, Chinese women. And so that led to 50 years of what was known as bachelor society in Chinatown, where um, you, you could just get a bunch of men and they're all aging. And of course they can't marry white women. So they were just all aging and dying, right? Uh, so this sort of this whole bachelor society. Um, so I think the what, what you were saying about a robot um, actually reminded me how fertility, um, Asian fertility is, is a, a, a real a real side of um, anxiety and threat um, to um, mainstream American um, culture and politics. Um, and so um, so there's that. Um, I also think that um, the uh, the um, the sort of lack of so I think there's a, a whole sort of allergy towards Asian fertility you know, in, in the first place. Um, but I also think, especially in some of these pieces, that um, the question of reproduction is interesting to me because these pieces don't, they don't, and it's, it's a larger question about things, right? They don't reproduce, but they can be replicated. And they can be, so all these are serial. In fact, the, the, the memory invasion, memory number five is part of, is one in a series, and so is the translated base of us. I can never decide how, how I want to say that word. <laughs> anyway, um, so, um, so I think that there, you know, there may be, um, I, I don't know if it's a, an, a, an allergy to the question of fertility, but I do think it, I don't think it, it may be, it might actually be, um, maybe the question isn't about fertility and reproduction. Maybe the question is about duplication or seriality or, um, yeah. So I think that even though, um, um, and, and then finally, I want to say that, in, you know, there's also another possibility, which is that there is a kind of um, uh, this, you know, there's a kind of misogyny and, you um, um, fear of female reproductive organs in sort of mainstream culture anyway, right? I mean, we're such, you know, that's why America is such a weird place. Like we, we see naked breasts and butts on TV all the time, but somehow we are, we're not supposed to, I think about reproductive organs. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think it's, but I, I do think with these, these pieces in particular, it's really interesting to think of, I don't think they're actually, I mean, I don't actually think they're infertile, right? I think they actually are very, generative, not the same thing as an organic biological fertility, but they are actually very, um, they are pieces that, that generates, both in themselves, because especially the e song is sort of like this bubbling, but it's also they're part of the series. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Chan. I wanted to take this opportunity to ask one more question as a way to close out the discussion. Um, your study has been so, hugely influential in Asian American studies and many different related academic fields and pushing us to think about the different logics working behind um, Asiatic femininity. And I wanted to ask if you might share some thoughts with us. Um, so ornamentalism published right before the pandemic and clearly we've seen a huge rise in anti-Asian violence throughout the last couple of years, um, especially in terms of really horrific and persistent um, displays of violence directed against Asian and Asian American women. Um, of course, the Atlanta spa shootings from just a little bit over a year ago serves as one of the most prominent, um, though hardly the only instance. Um, so I was curious if you could talk us through some of the ways in which you see the racial and gender logics operative in ornamentalism um, manifesting um, or shifting in this moment of resurging anti-Asian violence. Well, thank you for that question. I, I have to say that it, you know, it's it, it's heartbreaking to me that the book turned out to be, I mean, someone said, I mean, people have been saying to me, oh, the book is so prescient. And and that just broke my heart, right? Because I I, I want people to read a book, of course, but I don't want to read it because if it, the fact you know the price I wanted to pay for that price is, is too too big. Um so um so I think that one of the things that was you know, consider timely about is that it reminds us that 
that the objectification, so-called objectification of Asian women, um, one, has a very, very long history. Two, it has a very specific vocabulary. Um, and three, it is ongoing, right? That's, that's actually what's, what's heartbreaking is that the history that I'm talking about, you know, it started, you know, um, it's actually since antiquity, you know, because Plato would talk about sophistry as a kind of orientalness. I mean, this sort of, this long, long association um, between um, uh, Asianness and feminization and ornamentality and, you know, and decorativeness, it's, it, it's, so, and it's still ongoing today. And so what I think, um, what I think about the book and today is that, um, and actually I have started to do, and you know, it's funny that Dylan um, had, has sort of like given me a task to write another book. <laughs> uh, I'm actually, I'm actually doing that. It's a very different kind of book. I signed a book contract with Kana for a trade book. It's a book of essays and they're not academic essays. And the reason why I moved in that direction is kind of related to your question, which is, I think there's a lot of things I say in ornamentalism that are um, a, a theoretically, I think at least theoretically important. Um, and certainly for scholars, you know, because you know, it's a professional book in a professional world, it speaks to, you know, conversation. It speaks to avoiding the conversation, the ways in which Asian American and Asian femininity have actually been very rarely theorized, you know. Um, and so it speaks to that, that sort of void. But I think what I've been thinking a lot lately is how those larger you know, social categories of race and gender that I study so much for years and years of my life, how those things need to be understood as they get played out in the quotidian grains of everyday life. And so I started writing these essays that are um, semi-autobiographical, which makes it really scary to write. <laughs> um, but the reason I do it is because I think making that connection between these, you know, large theoretical and historical ideas about categories of gender, race, aesthetic, they actually, they're not just fancy ideas that academics play around with. They're actually things that have shaped and um, impacted the everyday lives of men and women. And, um, and learning to, you know, trying to write in such a way that can tease out how the how the, the private, the individual, the quotidian can actually bear the grains of these huge, you know, categories and social forces um, seems really important to me. So, um, so I actually am writing a new book, and I am thinking in that direction. <laughs> so. Thank you. Uh, so, I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, we're just a little bit past the seven o'clock hour, at least here in uh, St. Louis. And uh, Anne, just thank you so much for this really wonderful talk and for sharing your work with us um, and giving us um, a lot to, to sit with and think about um, as we as we move through the world. Um, and thank you to, to Dylan and Chris for joining in the conversation um, this evening. Um, thank you to all who joined as well, and um, yeah, have a wonderful rest of your days, and um, the link for the recording will be up on our YouTube channel in about a week or two if you'd like to revisit tonight's talk. Thank you, everyone, for a wonderful evening. Thank you. Bye.